nearly 690 million people worldwide are undernourished. That's about 9% of people on Earth that don't get the right food or enough of it. But at the same time, growing and producing food is among the biggest contributors to climate change. So how do we feed our planet without harming it? One idea, distributed renewable energy. Solar-powered mini-grids like this one can bring reliable power right into the fields. In Ethiopia and Kenya, the sun powers irrigation. In some of these cases, solar water pumps tripled the crop yield. Distributed renewable energy is one way to take the pressure off the environment while giving smallholder farmers the power they need to feed our planet. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see uh, people logging in from all, all over the world. Uh, welcome to everyone to this session of Making Good Food More Sustainable exploring the intersection between agriculture and energy. And we've got a great panel and some really good uh, ideas to, to share. Um, as you know, all know, while we're, all of us are battling COVID, we still are facing this extraordinary climate change crisis. And, and as, as almost everybody knows now, uh, that the, our food system accounts for not only 70% of the water being used in the world, but also for a, almost a quarter of all greenhouse gases. So as we think about a post-COVID recovery, how do we build back in a way that's better, more equitable? We have to be thinking about uh, using renewable energy to build back, better, build back a food system that is not destroying uh, the planet. And, um, and so there's a lot of innovation in this, in this area between uh, agriculture and energy, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, you know, this is a side event for the Borlaug Dialogues, and as um, many of you may know, Norman Borlaug, who, who did win the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, a, a, and the World Food Program now is a wonderful successor to that, um, was actually an employee of the Rockefeller Foundation for over 40 years. And um, and so there's a, we're, we're bringing a lot of history to this space in, in terms of taking the, this field to the next, next level. Um, we hope that this will really inspire folks, get people thinking about this area, and, and how we really, at the end of the day, decarbonize agriculture and, and the agricultural supply chain so that it, it is really um, enabling equity, accessibility, and affordability to, to everyone. Um, before I introduce my speakers, let me do a little housekeeping. Um, your audio and video functionality is going to be automatically disabled. Um, we'll have time at the end of our panel for uh, Q&A, so please put your questions in the Q&A. If you have some other ideas that you, uh, you want to chat, please use the chat feature. I, I always like tracking those, those things, and I think it's a great way to have uh, engagement and, and dialogue going on uh, and reaction. Uh, please note uh, the event is being recorded and we'll be monitoring to make sure that there's no intrusions, etc. Um, so uh, I'd like to now uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by Olivia Dubois, who is the Senior Natural Resources Officer and Coordinator of the Energy Program at the FAO. Uh, Te Mukunya Ounda, Oundo. Uh, founder and Managing Director of Asuri Health Limited, joining us from Nairobi. Uh, Jeffrey Prince, who's the Program Manager of Renewable Energy at the IKEA Foundation, joining us from the Netherlands. And then Seth Silverman, who's the Principal and Factory Ventures. And I'm not quite sure where you are, Seth. Uh, I know Olivia's in Rome, so um, I you, maybe you'll, you'll tell us. So uh, in New York City. Nice in to New see York you. City, okay, excellent. Well, that's where I am right now, too. Um, so a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, before we start, we wanted to just jump right in and get some of your uh, feedback. And we have two questions uh, that um, uh, Callie will, will put up. Uh, the first one is, uh, please go ahead and answer. It's really on a scale of one to five. How important is the ag energy nexus 
to for the achievement of the SDGs. Obviously, primarily SDG two, but it you know food systems apply to so many of them. So that do something really quickly. How important do you think this is? And then on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the degree of prioritization, visibility, and global commitment to advancing the ag energy nexus? So one being low and five being high. So everybody could just quickly answer those and uh, and then we will um, we'll, we'll, we'll get some feedback. And I think Kelly, you're gonna you're gonna automatically pop that up for us, right? Uh, all right, I don't see the results yet, Kelly, but I know some people, are, oh, okay. All right, so yes, we, we have a, uh, a non-random sample. Clearly, if you're joining in, you think this is important, uh, but it is interesting that you know, there's, there's some variation there. And even though we think it's very important, I think everybody recognizes that it really hasn't gotten the attention um, that this uh, uh, really does deserve. And, and I think there's incredible opportunity here for uh, impact. So with that, I would like to just introduce, uh, yeah, open it up to the full group and really ask this uh, question, fundamental question is, what's the experience that uh, brings you to this space, the Ag Energy Nexus, and what opportunities do you see in the Ag Energy ne Nexus? I'm going to try to keep you to two minutes. So, Olivier, do you want to just uh, uh, lead off? And you'll have to, everybody will have to unmute, including you. Yeah, sorry about this. Yes, thank you. No, I mean, as a young agronomist, I was living in very remote places where there was no uh, local electricity. So, we were depending heavily on fossil fuel from the capital city with problems of transportation, and then it was very expensive. But also working in FAO on the energy group, we realized that the current energy used in food system transformation is not sustainable. On the one hand, many people and small businesses lack access to energy, but at the same time, about the energy used in food chains represents about 30% of global available energy, mostly in the form of fossil fuel. And this, because of that, it's the, the, this energy used in food chains is like 20 to 25 percent of the GHG emiss emissions from these food chains. So it's basically unsustainable. Opportunities, I think, the the private sector in energy is interested in the private sector in, in the ag sector, the food system sector. It's a big market for them, but uh, the people in rural areas very often cannot pay the right price. But if their business so the, the, the farmers and small and medium agricultural enterprises, their business improves thanks to energy, then they can better pay the right price for energy. So improvement of business for farmers and small and medium agriculture companies is good for the business case of energy companies. Great, thanks Olivier. Seth, um, what brings you to this space and, and where are the opportunities? Sure, well, thanks Roy and, and to the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Food Prize in general for having me on the panel and excited to have this conversation with everybody else on it. Um, I come to the conversation from Factory Ventures. We're a venture impact development firm. We uh, originate impact ventures, um, focusing on the very earliest stages, which is often referred to as the seed stage. We started our work really focused on access to energy and through the Ag Energy Nexus have branched out to agricultural technology ventures, to waste and sanitation technology ventures, and to slightly less related sustainable mobility related technology ventures. We see a tremendous amount of opportunity in technology innovations that power development and power impact in emerging and developing economies, which is the core of what we do. And so we've been spending the past five years or so, building up a pretty exciting and interesting ag energy portfolio with category leaders across a couple of key segments from cold storage with innovative cold storage solutions like Inspira Farms to ag waste to energy with solutions like Systema Bio and uh, technologies in drying, for example, that transform agricultural value chains like S4S technologies. So we see a lot of opportunity at the Ag Energy Nexus 
but also a lot of challenge in terms of building scalable models um, that can actually serve uh, the, the regions and the communities that Olivier was just referring to. Um, so I'll leave it there for now, but really excited to dig in uh, to this conversation with the other folks on the panel. Fantastic. Thanks, Seth. Uh, Tay, what brings you to uh, this and space and where is the opportunity? Is you're right on the ground. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Roy, and I'm glad to be part of the for, of today's um, event. I'm I'm a Bolog fellow, so this is nice. I'm a 2013 Michigan State University Bolog fellow, and Absolutely. one of one of the great things that I got from this because I'm in food drying, and we're a business called Azuri Health, and we do food drying of um, mangoes, um, pineapples, a lot of vegetables and fruits, and as an end user. This has been one of the areas, the key areas that has been a challenge because there's so many um, uh, powered solutions for drying, but you wanna get what is, what is most cost efficient, what works for your systems, what works remotely. And so those are the solutions that Ag Energy would, would really um, work on, and especially as they are able to be scaled down to the farmer. And one of the, areas in yield wise through the Rockefeller Foundation we experienced and was very fruitful was um, working with farmers who would would do partial drying with solar and then we combine uh, the products and put them to market and as well as storage food storage on, on that was powered by um, solar grids so this is these are small solutions that can be scaled and we'd like to see a lot of that so as we have the conversations, there's a lot of experiences we've had, good and bad, that build up to the, to the story for drying and that uh, medium-sized um, businesses can be able to access and feel hopeful that, oh, finally our products can be uh, marketable because they are affordable. So that's the space we're in. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. And, and then finally, uh, Jeff, uh, do you want to, how, how did you get, find your way to Ag Energy? and where do you see those opportunities? Thanks, Roy. So I work at IKEA Foundation, and it, this, this subject area brings basically two uh, portfolios together, the agricultural portfolio and the renewable energy portfolio, which I'm a part of. And we work in the conviction that the system needs to change to be sustainable, um, very much in light of the two things we're quite passionate about. Uh, fighting and coping with climate change and ending uh, poverty. Uh, these ambitions are obviously, you know, the big ambitions on the horizon of 2030, but um, we don't have much time left. So that's um, one thing we bring to the table is conviction that things need to change. And I started in 2005 in the energy access space. So I know um, players like Factor E, so it's nice to be reconnected. The second thing we bring to the table is resources for innovation. So that's what I referred to. Um, we're very passionate about the end user and innovations for the end user. And we're bringing resources into play. Um, I think in terms of giving, we're comparable to Rockefeller Foundation, obviously the new kid on the block with less experience and less of a legacy and a history there but we're super excited about collaborating. And so thanks for having us on the panel. I hope we do justice to our agricultural colleagues. Uh, my specialty is more in renewable energy. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. So, you know, I think um, all of the panelists would agree that there's, there's a lot of opportunity here, you know, and you just look at, for example, how much um, solar panels themselves, the cost, of, uh, uh, of that, those, that technology is coming down so dramatically in the last uh, five years. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, drops by one third from three, even three years ago in a number of the locations. And also, we're now starting to see incredible interest by a whole range of actors and investments. So, you know, Rockefeller Foundation just entered into a partnership last year with Tata Power in India to, to um, build 10,000 mini grids, which is you know, an extraordinary number. Um, and that is really, you know, it is no longer a niche small area. This is some, something that is going to be profound and really affect uh, you know, virtually every, I, we believe almost every uh, agricultural supply chain in the world. 
Um, so, but you know, there's still challenges. So Olivia, you know, you've worked in this space uh, a very long time. What do you see as the key barriers slowing down the progress in the space? And, and what should governments and funders and businesses in the ag and energy sectors be doing to address them? Uh, Olivier? You are on mute, Olivier. Okay, sorry. Uh, we may have some technology knowledge gaps, but I think this is basically being solved because you have hopefully more and more national companies being developed. So you, you have people who are well trained, but this is absolutely key because before you had, or still currently you had a lot of projects with renewable energy, which were funded by donors. And then when the project stopped, the, the support services for the users were not there. It, it's still, you can still find that, but hopefully more and more local capacity is being developed. One thing that I'm very keen on is the, the fact that you don't have connections between the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Energy, and the folks working on water. So the whole issue of water, energy, food, nexus is absolutely key to be addressed when you look at renewable energy and the ag uh, energy nexus. Do you have trade-offs? Solar irrigation is often touted as great, win-win, but the danger is, for example, if you have irrigation for free, because solar energy is for free, once the investment is done, is you overpump. So you need to, you have a trade-off there. The same for biogas. You have nice biogas, but you need water for biogas in most of the biogas technology. So first, the water should be for the people and for the animals, especially in the arid zones. So you have trade-offs that you need to address through this nexus. And it's not happening. The, 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 the people who work on agriculture work separately from people working in energy and on, on water. Well, obviously the financial aspects is, is very, very, it's a big challenge. I mean, it's not only the, the investments, but also the operating costs. But the kind of opportunity I was mentioning before that the, the, the mutual interest for the, the farmers and small, medium agriculture enterprises and the energy companies, I'm speaking about big ones. FAU has been approached by NGNL, which are national big companies in, in Italy and, 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 and France, is, is, is a huge opportunity there. We have developed a, as an opportunity to de-risk these investments in like a methodology to look at cost benefit analysis of renewable energy in food chains, but not only the financial one, you need to have this water energy food nexus approach. So we look at environmental, social, economic, and financial. And by providing this information, you, the financiers, the investors, and the governments, you kind of de-risk, and then they can go a bit more detail once, once they found interesting opportunities think honestly we need to work a lot on innovative financing and and uh, with with COVID even the existing uh, energy systems people cannot pay uh, you know the, the the remaining money they have to pay for these systems because they don't make money from food chains because they cannot access the markets so you need money to invest to operate but to really like a firefighting is to help people pay for the existing uh, system. Uh, debt, holidays, stuff like that. It may be for a while, but I think with the pandemic affecting the, the energy chains, but also the food chains, people can't make it anymore. For many people, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Olivier. Uh, uh, and I, I think I really appreciate your point of you know, we still are very siloed. And, and I think it's one of the reasons why we need a food system summit. It was really, these, these, are, these require system solutions. And we don't, you know, if we don't do that, we get all the unintended consequences uh, of, uh, of, na of narrow in, uh, initiatives. Um, Tay, you, you, you yourself has, have a really strong success story with your work at Asuri Health. And I was telling folks earlier, I really enjoy uh, her mango product, it's amazing. Uh, but I'm sure you've also seen a lot of the challenges Olivier has, uh, has mentioned um, with a very practical on the ground perspective. So I wanted to ask, can you tell us about an example of productive use technologies at the Ag Energy Nexus from your own experience? And what are the lessons of these success that successes offer, what, particularly when it comes to making sustainable energy 
a practical choice for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, Kay? Um, thank you, uh, Roy. Um, I, I really relate to what Olivia is saying, Olivia is saying about um, the challenges. And, and for us at Azuri, it's been um, a 10-year journey. And starting off as, as many small businesses start, you start at home, uh, in your backyard, and you're putting together your products, and, and when it's on a small scale, it, it really works because you can just get up and go to the garden, harvest your product, package it in the house and sell it. But as you start to scale, that's when um, the challenges do come because you've got to have a breadth of knowledge, understand the value chain. And maybe you might be focusing on solving one aspect, like for us, it's in production and manufacturing. So we are producing nice, high quality products. Um, but the farmers might not be able to preserve their, their crop, especially let's take mango and, and it's seasonal. So we can't have um, all of it coming in at once for us to dry and be able to put to market to the volumes that are required. And so there's lots of gaps still. So in our mission to solve post-harvest loss challenges, then we find that as we scale up, we've got to work with the farmers, we've got to work with the markets, and you're in your little space. And so the, again, the silos start to come in. And, and also the, the, the ability, we talked, um, Oliver, you talked about uh, water. Farmers will, will have challenges on water. We will have challenges. We need to have that going. And um, in terms of um, the sustainability, as we scale, scaling means a lot of times you've got to scale on electricity, you've got to scale on uh, LPG, there's solutions on biofuels, and many times the information is not always available. So you find a lot of SMEs also investing in the wrong things, and, and that's also a very painful part of it. And so some of the solutions we have found, I would direct it towards um, capacity building and learning. Um, if I take the Borlaug um, fellowship that I went to, it was on drying. How do you know how to dry your foods right? For the right markets. That was vital information that as an, as an SME and a growing business I needed so that I can be able to plug into what's happening in the, in, in the value chain and understand, oh, so if I stick to solar and manage it and understand how to dry using solar panel, using the knowledge that I have uh, created, then it will be a solution because I'll be able to put my products in market. So that's, that, those are some of the successes that would say came painfully but they do some, um, come into an understanding at some point. So there's a lot of new ways we are thinking and developing now products that will be able to, to fit into this kind of uh, way of thinking. Uh, thanks so much, Kay. I uh, appreciate you know, building any business is hard, but uh, we see the, uh, the results and the amazing product that you, you've created. Um, so, you know, uh, Jeff, you at the IKEA uh, Foundation, you know, we have really focused in this this ag and the nexus as well, and 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 I've loved watching how IKEA has been so innovative. Can you tell us a little bit about how energy and agriculture sectors can address inequities in the system and and lead to increased livelihoods? You know, we all know that we're in a world that's increasing. Uh, the increasing inequity is going to is extraordinary, and we've got to also then take extraordinary uh, efforts to, to, to address that. So you've been doing some really interesting work in this area. Jeff, over to you. Thanks. Um, so uh, like any foundation, we're as good as the partners we fund. Um, so we've taken a lot of inspiration from Salco Foundation and Access to Energy Institute. Um, and they've approached the issue from really from the user perspective. And uh, we also borrow from sort of the democratic design inspiration from IKEA, which basically says it has to work for the user. Is it the right price and performance mix? And the great thing that you see with efficiency in solar, that combination can be brought to the doorstep of impoverished families. So you don't make them um, uh, travel far. Uh, you can bring these assets to their doorstep and these assets can be owned and operated by them. So that's quite a game changer. And for example, we see this in the dairy sector. 
um, a lot of dairy farmers have limited number of cows, for example, because they don't have the appliances or the, the energy to go from milking by hand to uh, more an e efficient operation, which is possible nowadays with an efficient milking machine or uh, run by solar. But there are also different machines like a cooling, processing, uh, biogas. Um, so a whole mix of things can come into play, which we're trying to support. Um, it's, it's a new sector, so that's, that goes with ups and downs. Um, and, and the challenges that Olivier and, and Tai referred to about, you know, um, the money issue, testing, innovation, um, getting different pieces of the enabling environment together are, are quite challenging. So if, if anything, um, technology is great, but it has to go together with the enabling system which uh, we need to remember that finance is very much key and market linkages. So uh, just like uh, nature, uh, nature thrives from a good ecosystem. We can't just plant a tree in the desert, uh, or we could, uh, but it would take a lot of resources. Uh, but if we would leave, it would, it would die out. So we have to really look at the ecosystem and the enabling environment when we're introducing these technologies. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, you, you touched on this whole question of an ecosystem. And uh, Seth, this question of financing and providing the means to people to do this kind of work has come up a, a number of times. And, and you deal directly with that as an investor. But can you tell us about an experience that shaped the direction of your company's work and uh, going forward? And, and what can, advice can you offer to policymakers and, and funders seeking to embrace the full potential of renewable energy innovations in, in the food system. Seth. Yeah, this is, this is such a fun conversation. I was itching to get into some of the great comments that have already been made. Um, as you mentioned, we, we focus on a particular flavor of innovative finance or rather finance for innovation. And that's really driving at the earliest stages of getting a technology venture that can scale across markets um, to, to come into life really. Um, and to do that, we in organize our investments around discrete theses. Um, we really focus on um, brokering technologies that are, are emerging globally into, let's call them energy access markets. And then we try to bridge the philanthropic and development communities with the commercial investment communities. Um, we're successful if our impact ventures are uh, graduating from concessional capital to commercial capital at increasingly large uh, quantums. Um, but um, in, in the process of developing our theses, we really kind of take two building blocks. One is uh, a phase of techno-economic analysis, where we really look at the kind of details of, of technology performance that, that Jeff was alluding to, um, and then make sure that in concept across a range of scenarios, a technology venture is offering its approach can succeed. And then we look at deeply at the market context. And we've actually recently done a project uh, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation's power team where we looked at a very practical set of ag energy demonstrations. Can we make this application of drying technology or that application of anaerobic biodigestion uh, work in practice in sub-Saharan Africa? And since it's fre fresh, I'll, I'll kind of refer to some of the lessons we've learned from those projects. Um, one is that, sure, the ag energy opportunity is real, but it's not uh, just lying on the table. Agriculture in particular, agriculture can't solve the, rural, the challenges of the rural electrification and rural energy access business model. Um, it, it may sound obvious, particularly to the World Food Prize audience, but the, the solutions have to be built around the customer, and that customer is either a farmer or an SME agribusiness like Azuri Health. Um, and we also have to be thinking less narrowly about the ag energy opportunity. So it's not just renewable energy in terms of solar paneling, but thinking broadly, as you were saying, Roy, in food systems at where the sources of energy are in agriculture. For example, I've long advocated for thinking about fertilizer access as a form of energy access. 2% of the world's energy goes into fertilizer, which is a massive uh, consumption, cons consumer of energy in its manufacture. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, less, less than 3% of the world's fertilizer is consumed, even though 20% of the world's arable, arable land is on the continent. That's an energy access problem, and that's a form of 
when it comes to ag energy projects, and we've learned this through this recent experience, um, execution is the key. And for that, we need a suite of agribusiness partners like Missouri Health that can actually adopt technologies and deploy them into markets, whether they're drying or cold storage or any number of solutions that uh, my fellow panelists were referring to. And then uh, slightly more self-interestedly, um, the pipeline of quality innovative enterprises is still a little bit thin. What we exist to do at Factory is build that pipeline and grow it more broadly for both the impact and the commercial potential that it has. But we need philanthropic partners like the Rockefeller Foundation and, and others to recognize the value in that and that they're best situated to take the risk on innovative enterprises and, and those that are building them. And then finally, thinking about governments, one of the things that we recognize in the course of building this portfolio of projects is that scale actually really matters. A large project may be more likely to succeed than a small demonstration project because it can attract the attention of high quality um, established actors because they're interested, it's worth, it's worth their while to engage, um, but also because you can integrate and break through the silos of energy and agriculture um, by taking a regionalized approach. We had a, a really interesting opportunity to marry cold storage and mini grids, um, but couldn't find them in the same physical location on the time frame that we had. A, an integrated regionalized planning approach, which uh, a country government could take on or a multilateral development finance institution could, could, could motivate, um, is a real opportunity to bring that ag energy nexus together, but it requires a certain level of scale. Thanks. Seth, that's super helpful. I'm curious um, if, if panelists uh, had any uh, comments to the other panelists. Uh, there's been a lot of ideas just shared. Anything that anybody wants to jump in and, and, and share before we go to Q&A? Uh, Sorry, uh, here. I think one thing which would really help is to be able to map, you know, using all these uh, global platforms, remote sensing, GIS, name it, the links between ag and energy on the ground at national and subnational level. Because we know that in, in many cases, obviously, you may produce more food, but you, if, if you cannot process it, then you lose, you have a lot of food losses. But if, if you can do that and say, well, okay, uh, here's a potential to significantly increase the yields of crops like corn, but we don't have energy, and the grid will come late, then you can organize, you can plan where you locate your off-grid systems. Because right now it's happening a bit ad hoc. And so there's a big opportunity, there's a big initiative, sorry, uh, in, uh, in the FAO, which is called the Hand in Hand Initiative, which uses all the data platforms and data sets that we have in FAO on, on fertilizer, on land, on water uh, and agriculture crops and we want to increase the energy uh, contribution to that. So mapping out the ag energy links would really help in optimizing the locations of these operations. Moving away, I think, from ad hoc support. And so I think this is an area where there's a, there's a big gap and, uh, and, and we know that some, some people are doing this. I mean, I know from partner uh, powering uh, for all uh, they, are, they have done this job in Uganda and it's very, very interesting because then you optimize your resources as a, as a, as a, as a government, as a funding uh, organization to really locate where there's, there's more uh, opportunities actually for agriculture. This is just an observation that I have. Thanks, Olivier. And Tay or Jeff or Seth, any other um, comments? Yes, I, I would say that this is again, very stimulating. And um, what, I, what I picture is that 10 years ago, this discussion wasn't possible. And so as we've, we've gone along and um, products have developed and there's a lot of new innovation, there's a lot of interest in, in what the end products are for um, that utilize natural um, high, high value products. So this is a good time to plug in and also to consolidate. What I'd say is that um, from an SME perspective, consolidation of, of various SMEs to, to join hands and, and produce, especially within countries, and gather support is, is important so that it's not a one, one person show, one business show, but we all work together in being able to achieve this. Because then at the end of the day, if there's a solar grid set up, 
then we can all use it um, for our different products. So the combinations of these would, would help a lot. So it's good to think that way as well. Yeah, yeah just, just to chime in from our side, um, uh, we're quite excited about some of the programs uh, that received UK aid funding, and we match that funding to, it's a, called the PRIO program, Powering Renewable Energy uh, Opportunities. So it brings, for example, fishers together with an energy provider. Um, so the fishers are obviously good at what they're doing, and the energy provider, Seamus Solar in this case, is good at uh, offering cold storage and ice, ice solutions. Um, so that's what we're seeing there. And, in terms of trying to consolidate the SME sector. So I, I really like that idea, Ty. And just to react, react to Olivier, um, uh, there is some work done by CAFOD and uh, the World Resources Institute in Kenya to really uh, to, to map out demand and to really get a more of a rational data-driven uh, resource allocation uh, based on demand and, and needs, just like Rocky Mountain Institute is doing in Ethiopia, and all have clear ties with, with Rockefeller Foundation there. And I appreciate the Power for All um, reference because I think they're doing some good work as well in Uganda. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, there's a couple of, let's move to a few of the questions in, in the, in the Q&A. We have 17 questions. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them. So I'm going to just pick and choose ones, especially ones that are directed. Um, so one of them says, you know, Jeff, you brought up small dairy farms as an example of an entity needing support for renewable energy. However, we know that the dairy industry and animal agriculture as a whole is extremely inefficient in terms of water use, land use, greenhouse gas production. Wouldn't it then be somewhat of a conflicting interest to support the growth of dairy farms by providing funds for renewable energy? That's a tough question. Jeff, what do you uh, think? That's a, uh, that's a good question. And um, so our agriculture our co colleagues, agriculture livelihoods portfolio, they always come into play when we look at renewable energy interventions. They always say, listen, uh, our, our food systems, they have to change, they have to become more inclusive, circular, and regenerative. So we often we take these principles to heart when, when we do anything. So it was alluded to before, you know, you can have free energy to pump all the water you want, but it, that's not sustainable if, if your water tables are, are drying out. Um, of course, it, it depends on each, each geography in that, in that case. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, dairy is still part of our food system. It's, it offers some nutrition and it, it goes hand in hand with, um, so, so uh, I remember Louisa Fresco when she was at the FAO, she also always said, um, dairy, if, if we still want to consume dairy products, there, there's also that, that, that other side to it it presents basically some dilemmas. So again, we're focused on smallholder farmers, so the impact is different, but uh, you know, based on the principles that we adhere to, that it's inclusive, regenerative and circular, um, we have to be careful about that. We don't have the clear answer, unfortunately. I wish we did, but uh, it does drive our thinking in, in the things that we support. I hope that answers the question. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, yeah. Olivia. If I may, may, may add something. This is exactly the kind of thing we should avoid to generalize because cases can differ. I mean, the situations, and you need to provide the intelligence to or the information, the tools to get the the right information on these, you know, the economic aspects, the environmental aspects, and the social aspects. It's not that you know dairy farming is always bad. I mean, it, you have situation. It's very good. I mean, it's doing a good job. And you, if, you, if you can use the manure from the cows to, to regenerate the soil and improve the soil and reduce greenhouse gases, so much the better. So, I mean, it's, it's an approach. It's, it's circularity, it's resource use efficiency, but we should avoid generalize because it's actually a complex business. And we should embrace the complexity. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I mean, in FAO, we have 
tools that do exactly that for the livestock, the cattle. We have a whole tool that looks at all these different aspects. So you, you need, we have developed these innovative tools because it's, it's, a, it's a new approach to integrate these aspects. And also because of the challenge of climate change. I mean, let's face it. Yeah. But I mean, what my message is let's avoid to overgeneralize and, and we need to embrace the complexity. Great point. Um, what, the next question is, you know, many of the technologies uh, are available, but the costs are high for farmers who are already burdened. For instance, in India, how does the Rockefeller or IKEA Foundation look to address this gap instead of just funding NGOs to set up models? Pilots are not needed. It is more partnering with SMEs to take things forward in villages. Um, so, uh, you know, let me, I'll, I'll address this, but I think actually other people would be happy to jump in as well. You know, without a doubt, this has to be, in many cases, this has to be driven by the private sector. I mean, that's been the problem with so many renewable energy projects of the past. Um, and that is going to, and we think that, you know, A, that enables um, uh, 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 folks, you know, the, the right maintenance contracts, the right supply contracts, um, enables um, uh, lots of things to happen that, you know, if this is just an NGO-led um, a process, it's, it's not going to have the scale, scale we need. And I think we can drive down costs dramatically if we do things like bulk procurement, if we get the right subsidy systems in place. You know, no, uh, almost no agriculture in the world has been able to progress without some types of subsidies. And ideally you are subsidizing the right things and not the wrong things, which in many cases, that's what we're doing in, in many agricultural systems. But uh, Jeff, your, any thoughts on this? And yeah, um, uh, three things that I'd like to put forward. It's so it's a pretty new sector. So maybe uh, a few years ago, you had a handful of productive use renewable energy technologies. Nowadays, it's getting into the twenties to the hundreds. Um, so some of our work through Selco Foundation, for example, has involved a lot of outreach to banking institutions. Mm -hmm. India obviously has a well-developed banking um, system and they have de dedicated lending practices. So that's where Selco is trying to tap into there. CEW together with Vilgro is testing some business cases and how they might grow in India. So that might be worth uh, looking at. And then finally, we're trying to team up with Rabobank Foundation to offer a credit line for, to introduce pr a productive use of renewable energy technologies to farmer producer organizations. Great, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd love to jump in and perhaps weave together a couple of strands of this conversation. So um, agree broadly with the point that we perhaps don't need more pilots, but I think there is a tremendous amount of value in demonstration, particularly when that demonstration generates data about the performance of a particular asset or a particular application of a solution in rural areas. And that's precisely because we're not gonna be able to generate scale capital for financing assets and solutions if we don't have performance data about how those solutions return. And so where philanthropic capital can de-risk those early applications, generate that early data, and then induce banking, the local banking sector to become a lender to, to, to local agribusinesses and SMEs, then we've taken um, risk tolerant, essentially zero return or negative return philanthropic capital and turned it into impact going forward. And so that's a really interesting and important component of seizing the ag energy opportunity. How do we unlock asset finance at scale um, for the sector? I think the other thing is really around um, bridging, and this is part of Olivier's point on mapping, bridging the potential in theory of a technology or a solution, um, both at the spreadsheet level, um, we can sh show, a, or even a pilot level, we can show a farmer triples her yield with, uh, with, uh, with, with solar irrigation, um, but also at the, at the kind of continental or global scale. We see the potential for irrigation across Africa, but where are we going to uh, deploy it, right? And for that, we do need to map um, the water resources, the agricultural systems, um, the, um, the markets to identify where the hotspots are for a solution or an opportunity to be deployed. Thanks, Seth. Uh, any other thoughts there? Okay, great. Um, so uh, Lloyd LePage asks, uh, Seth mentioned Inspira Farms. How can we make sure these cold chains and other such investments that are funded by governments and development partners 
including multilaterals, are actually linked to viable business plans at the local level, and, and that they incorporate circular economy and energy efficiency metrics. So another big question. Over to you, Seth. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll jump right in there again. I mean, I think the, the primary way you ensure that is by um, investing in a company like that that serves actual customers. And so in farms isn't deploying primarily access and traders that are needing solutions um, at the first mile. Uh, and so that's the primary way you, you kind of shoot past that. The, the additional way you shoot past that, particularly in the context of rene renewable energy, which has an attractive payback period over time, is to transform a, an upfront cost into a running cost, right? And so you essentially do that through embedding financing into the solution. And so increasingly, companies like Inspira Farms are offering their agribusiness customers cooling as a service, higher purchase facilities, and lease financing. And that's a lot for a young company to take on, not just the, the, the generating the technology, um, manufacturing it, deploying it into market, um, acquiring customers, but also financing them. And so that's a real challenge, but there's no other way around it. You have to embed Uh, we, we, you're cutting off, you're cutting off Seth. Solution in the offering. All right. I think we caught most Financing in the, in the solution. Great. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, I think it's your end, but it could be mine too. Um, great. Um, uh, could, could I jump in there quick? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, um, go ahead. So I think Seth, he, he touched on a few things like the data and, and understanding performance and, and de-risking. And um, so I think, I, I think it would be interesting to uh, do some pushes like uh, what's been done with electric vehicles. When you look at total cost of ownership, uh, you're, you're essentially buying an electric vehicle with the fuel already in place for the coming years and uh, maintenance is low. So you have sort of a switch on total cost of ownership, you have sort of a service model option. But what I'd like to also to look at is, what are the external costs? Um, and these could be a, a broad array of external costs that come into play, uh, which promotes the, the deployment of efficiency in renewables. So for example, if you look at the Indian context, there's always been a migration from the city to the rural area. I think, or the rural area to the city, about 45 million people, I think, per year. Now you're seeing a reverse migration. You know, if we would invest more in renewables and efficiency to allow for that reverse migration, where they're, you know, working on the farm becomes attractive because it's not associated with drudgery. What, what? That's kind of an external cost that would come into play in my mind. Um, um, so another external cost, if you look at farmers having to process and mill their, their products, their final, their harvests, sometimes they have to travel four kilometers to 40 kilometers. Well, if you bring efficiency in solar to the doorstep, that's a cost that you avoid. So I think if you bring these different costs, maybe it's an impossible exercise to calculate, but if you bring these costs together, I think the the you know pollution travel etc migration uh, the the case for renewables and efficiency becomes super strong thanks jeff tay i mean you're you're in the middle uh, of, of making this happen as an agribusiness um you know and this is touching a lot i think on, on a lot of the challenges you're also facing i'm just curious if you want to share any insights yeah i'd, I'd also um it's interesting that there's a lot of proposed solutions and one of the angles now again from an agricultural produce um, angle is, is to also, what we are doing is exploring solutions on the, the actual drying of the produce. So what are the other ways we could use these technologies to do more and to have greater impact and to delve into solutions that transform the foods into something that is even better for the consumers. So looking at, look, looking at the, the, the different viable options, there's um, uh, processes like freeze drying, there's processes, so many different types of processes that 
give products that are high quality, but what about that takes takes products away from from the farm to a more high tech kind of processes. So can we take those processes back and simplify them to get an equivalent type of product that would then be able to get us back to working with farmers and 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 um, bringing processing and value addition closer to the ground. So those are some of the solutions we are coming up with and doing quite well with that. So um, that is another angle that we could pull out from looking for ways to get to get the the end product even more refined in a way that can work going backwards again to what we're trying to solve in the first place. Yeah, and I suppose that would make it a lot more interesting and appealing to youth because then you don't have the drudgery as it was mentioned before. And, and we really need to get agriculture to be uh, attractive to youth because we need to, we need to continue, you know, farmers and, and, and food system entrepreneurs to, to, to really come in in a big way. You know, one of the things right. that struck me, Tay, oh, uh, uh, let me just finish, this, Tay, is, is uh, you know, when I, when the kind of what works you're doing is increasing nutrition, you're, you're trying to use so, you know, renewable energy, and you probably get no subsidies from the government uh, and, and almost virtually anything you do. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is challenging, you're doing so many great stuff, and yet we haven't built systems to really encourage that. And I think a number of the questions were really, you know, how do we, um, you know, specifically the one question like Jane asked, you know, that the FAO and Rockefeller Foundation, how do we compel governments to subsidize energy solutions um, and to make it more affordable and accessible to potential users who are engaged in cold storage and processing? It's really the broader question of what's the right level of subsidy? What's the right government? Um, um, uh, policies to actually enable this to happen. And, and I know you've all been uh, involved in some way and we have just a few minutes left and I didn't want to leave this without uh, some conversation on, on the role, on that role on enabling conditions. Does anybody want to take that uh, uh, and have, one, have an answer to that? Olivier. One thing that, I mean, unfortunately this pandemic has, has highlighted something is, is the link between food energy and health. And okay, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem, this pandemic, but if you think that the ag energy can also help health locally, because energy for food can also be used for clinics and, and pumping good water and so on. And so it's, it's, it's again, it's an opportunity to link these aspects. And then the government might say, well, we need to subsidize health. Therefore, we also need to, to look at the ag energy link. And so you have an opportunity there to say, well, you know, you, you, you take three boxes with, with one, you know, stone, basically. You kill three birds with one stone, health, agriculture, and local energy. And I think this is an opportunity, but um, subsidies, yes, you need them at the beginning, but I think public-private partnerships must quickly come into the picture. And very, we, you need to have smart subsidies and people should be aware that after a while, we have to move to a market approach. Otherwise, at some stage, it's not sustainable. It stops abruptly and that's it. Nothing happens anymore. My word of caution is whenever we talk about financing instruments and all of that, is to go back to my initial uh, recommendation, have a broader approach, a water, energy, food nexus, environmental, social, economics, because there are trade-offs. There are also synergies and, and we need to first have a that's kind of this big picture approach to say, well, it's feasible, it's sustainable from these three pillars, point of view, social, environmental, financial, broadly financial, before going into detail into the financial instrument. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, we have three, three minutes left. Uh, Tay, Seth, Jeffrey, um, do, you want to, do you want to add anything to that question or, or another question or any of the questions? We have 29 questions and I think we got the four of them. Uh, so, and I really apologize to the folks, but uh, if there's a specific question you'd like to address or add, let's let's do a quick round, good quick final round. Uh, Jeff. So just to add, a, add to Olivier, uh, his, his comments, I, I, I mean, what I appreciate with the Rockefeller Foundation push for mini grids, 
is it, it, it's sort of a law. It says we have to go beyond lighting. Energy access isn't just lighting. It's powering livelihoods and jobs. And that's worth concessional finance, I think. Uh, finance that we're using for all our infrastructure projects um, for, you know, finance that lasts for 20 years and it's concessional. It's not a high interest rate. So that's just something that I want to add. So I think um, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks. Uh, Tay, do you want to, any final thoughts or a final question you want to answer? Yeah, I think, um, again, maybe just looking at uh, luring governments into the discussion would be great. And, and again, as Olivia said, looking at the solutions where there's interest and, and where there are solutions um, for other things apart from uh, what we are working on individually would be great. And that's, that's a good idea that we can carry forward and lobby for. Just look for synergy in, in many different areas, broaden our thinking that it's not just food, there's so many other ways that we can use this energy. Fantastic. Seth. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up with a few thoughts on the question of uh, subsidy and the role of government. Um, I think particularly from an investor perspective, it may seem strange, but if you look at agriculture and energy sectors, they're both regulated and subsidized everywhere around the world. And so the question for government is, what are we subsidizing? What are we trying to prop up and how, if we're trying to move towards a, a paradigm of climate solutions and a more equitable and sustainable sustainable growth? How do we level the playing fields, remove subsidies from fossil resources and dirty solutions and uh, stimulate uh, the uh, virtuous cycle of renewable solutions taking, taking off? And when we think about the role for government across agricultural sectors, that boils down to just a few key areas. Extension services and advisory for farmers, um, mm -hmm. assistance with risk transfer, particularly in the form of insurance, and creating an, a business environment where um, renewable energy businesses and sustainable agribusinesses can thrive. And that comes from infrastructure and that comes from uh, an enabling environment for finance so that these businesses can grow. And so I would urge governments in uh, position to evaluate the question of what are we subsidizing to look into those areas. That is the fundamental question. Um, and Olivia, last word and then we're gonna have to end. You're on mute, Olivia. For me, yes, governments should think about their people. And, and, and if you, but if you, I would like to add something. A demonstration is good because then you can show it to the policy makers and to the politicians. But at the same time, we should not stick to the demonstrations because then farmers see, oh, it's a demo. We cannot access that. But for me, the last word is to have this this integrated approach and um, yes, convinced by, by doing pilots, but having a market approach as soon as possible, because otherwise we, we will never reach scale. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, well, I see in our chat that Naeem recognizes that one hour is not sufficient. To, we're really scratching the surface on a, on a lot of this. And, and clearly there's a lot of energy, uh, and pun intended, uh, to uh, in, in this in, in this topic, uh, so I want to thank your the panelists. The recording will be available, and maybe Callie, you can put in what when and how that will be available in the chats. Um, and uh, and then with that, uh, I think I, I our time is up, and we're going to be kicked out soon out of this room. So I, I want to appreciate the panelists, Olivier, Tay, Seth, Jeff and all the incredible listeners who provided amazing questions. And I apologize we didn't get to them, but this is the beginning of, a, of an amazing conversation. And I think we're gonna hear a lot more about the ag and the genexus. So take care everyone and uh, good kind regards, take care. <laughs>